to thank everybody for being here tonight. The days are getting darker and darker. It just feels dark in here. So it's good to see all of y'all in here. And uh, we are on our third lesson on social media. And I'm trying to arrange these pretty logically, as logically as I can. We just started out talking about the societal impact of social media and started with the lesson on focus last week. That relates, I think, to what we're talking about tonight, which is time. And I said this last week that while there are a lot of dangers in social media, it's a dangerous playground, as we're saying, uh, probably the most dangerous thing or the greatest temptation is just wasted time. And one of the points that we made last week was that it often turns our minds to worthless things. And we even looked at some passages in the Psalms, in Psalm 119, where the psalmist prays to God to turn my head from worthless things. And we're going to elaborate on that a little bit tonight. That's how the connection of time comes in. Time is really important. And the Lord evidently thought it was important on the fourth day of creation. We read about how he created the sun and the moon and the stars. And... If you read the Genesis account, those of you in Will's class have studied this inside and out, I'm sure. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, the Lord says, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens, separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and for years. It's really interesting. We often think about the light and the warmth and the uh, you know photosynthesis and all of the uh, things that science has taught us, we need from the sun in particular, but also the moon and the stars and the relationship of the tides maybe to the moon and other things of that nature. And I don't think we talk as much about how we still use astrological data more than anything to tell time. Uh, there are a lot of other methods, but the most reliable or the one we keep going back to was named by God on the fourth day of creation. So he created time. He's the one who made it. And he went to the trouble of putting a lot of heavenly bodies in the universe for it. And so I think it's something worth our attention. and something that definitely relates to social media. Um, time is important. So it's important, first of all, because God created it. But another reason why time is important is because basically time is the same thing as life. I mean, how do you define time except that it's life. If you ask me for five minutes of my time, you're asking me for five minutes of a measure of my life. And if time is life, then time is important because I think we all agree that, that life is important. Life is extremely important. Instinctively, we know that life is sacred. That's one of the strongest human instincts, right? Self-preservation. And um, it's hard to, hard to fight that instinct, and there's a good reason for that. We, God wants us to stay alive, so he instinctively, he made us with instincts to try to fight to stay alive. Um, one of my favorite authors is Fyodor Dostoevsky, and uh, he writes about this in a lot of his books, probably because of something that happened to him when he was a young man. He fell in with a group of political... Um, insurrectionists, I guess you'd call them, anti-government group in Russia during the Tsar, the days of the Tsars, and he was arrested for anti-government propaganda and stuff like that. And he wasn't one of the ringleaders, he was just interested in radical politics at that time. But he was arrested and sentenced to death. And this was one winter in St. Petersburg. They stripped them almost naked, him and his buddies, and lined them up on a wall in front of a firing squad, and at the very last minute when they were about to pull the trigger, I think all of this was orchestrated to intimidate people, but a guy came up on horseback and said that their sentence had been commuted to hard labor in Siberia and then forced a service in the <clears throat> military. So he did 10 years time in Siberia and in the military before he was finally released. And it was after that that he wrote some of his greatest works. And in one of them, Crime and Punishment, the main character, this guy named Raskolnikov, he's meditating upon life. And
and how he wants to live. His life is now in danger. And here's an excerpt from that. He says, where is it I've read that someone condemned to death says an hour before his death that if he had to remain standing on a square yard space all his life, a thousand years, eternity, it were better to live so than to die at once. I don't know if you would agree with that, but you haven't been in Dostoevsky's shoes. I mean, he was the one up against the wall in front of a firing squad and had, you know, more perspective than most of us to think about whether he wanted to live or not. And I feel like I have no proof of this, but these words maybe were inspired by that moment where he was thinking, even if I had to go to Siberia, even if I had to do forced labor, even if I was forced into military service, even if I stood in one square yard of space for the rest of my life, I'd rather do that than to die. Now that's some strong uh, self-preservation instincts there, and God put that in us. And that's one of the reasons we know life is valuable, but we can also measure the value of life in terms of how God has uh, esteemed it through what he did for us. Uh, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So God determined that our life was worth the cost of the blood of his own son. And another passage that comes to my mind, you probably thought of this one as well, is Matthew 16.26 where Jesus asks this rhetorical question. He says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return or in exchange for his soul? The word translated soul is suke, which also means life. The ESV really struggled with this translation. The first edition of the ESV had the word life there. And I didn't like it much because being raised on, I think, every other translation, King James especially, soul just always went in there in my mind. And of course... That's a good translation of this. But also, you have to understand, it's not just the spirit of man, but he's talking about the whole person, body, soul, spirit. He's talking about life there. And the question is, why would you give your life up for anything? Your life, including your immortal soul, you know, you may give up your physical life to save your immortal soul. That's what this verse is about. But why would you give it up? It's so valuable. And I said a lot to make this point that life is valuable. I probably didn't need to take all that time because you probably already realized that. But let's take it back to our original subject of time. If time, in, if time is life, and if you ask me for five minutes of my life and it's five, five minutes of my time, it's the same as asking me for five minutes of my life. And life is very valuable, then time is extremely valuable. Now, when we engage with social media, are we aware of that fact? Or is it something that just sucks time up? I know what I think about it, and I'll let you judge for yourself, but I think it wastes a lot of time. And there are studies to show, and I mentioned these, I think, in the first class, that teenagers spend now an average of nine hours a day online. <laughs> That includes streaming television and music. So if you just take out the social media of that, it's two hours a day. Preteens are spending six hours a day online, about two hours a day on social media as well. To put that into perspective, I've got this chart here. I don't know if you can see these stats, but starting over at the left, here's uh, social media time ranked with daily activities. So Americans generally spend seven years and eight months of their lives watching TV. That's another quarter study right there. That's another problem. But uh, next to it, number two now, is social media. We're spending five years and four months of our lives on social media. While only three years and five months eating and drinking, grooming, I think this is a lot lower for some people, uh, one year and 10 months, socializing outside of social media, of course, one year and three months, and only six months doing laundry. That doesn't include moms. They do a lot more laundry than that. So you can see social media, five years and four months of our lives using that statistic that uh, uh, if we spend two hours a day on social media. To put that into perspective, in that time, five years and four months, we could go to the moon and back 32 times. We could walk the Great Wall of China three and a half times 
we could watch The Simpsons. I don't recommend this, but you could watch The Simpsons 215 times, climb Mount Everest 32 times. You could run, if you don't die first, 10,000 marath marathons, or you could walk your dog 93,000 times, which is something some of you probably have done. Uh, so this is valuable time. You think about all the activities that you could do in that time frame, two hours a day. There's a really interesting, one of our teenagers told me about this, a really interesting new feature in the latest iOS update, which is your iPhone. If you don't have an iPhone, I don't know if you have this option, but your uh, iPhone operating system, which will tell you how much screen time you've used. We were playing with it this afternoon, and I think it's over a 24-hour period, like up to that point. You can look under uh, system and scroll down, and there's a thing that says screen time. It's kind of scary. You, you punch it, and it'll tell you how much screen time you've used over the last 24 hours and how much of that time has been on social media. Now, if you want to look at that now, I will give you permission to look at your phones during Bible class to look at that. But it's kind of it's kind of humbling to see if you check it out. Or maybe you're like, oh, I spent like one minute on that. I'm doing pretty good. I don't know. Uh, but that is a good tool. And you can set alerts. You can set it to shut down, you know, at a certain time period. So it's kind of like... It's kind of like Miller Lite advertising against drunk driving. You know, the iPhone is putting these safety things on your screen time, but it's something anyway. We'll take it, right? Um, check that out. That's a good tool to use. Uh, Carrie Turner shared with me something um, that she read where this author she'd been reading will basically give change his social media passwords every week and give it to... Uh, he changes somehow where he doesn't know it and he gives it to his personal assistant and she doesn't let him know what his passwords are till the weekend and then every Monday he changes it over again that's pretty severe but if you're really serious about limiting your screen time and managing your time on social media there are ways to do it there are tools to do it it's just a question if you think it's important enough if you think time is important enough to do it Let's look at um, another passage. I mentioned this a minute ago in the devotional, Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. Here's what Paul writes. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. I love the translation redeeming the time, but the problem with it is you can't really redeem time. You can't get any more time than you have. You have 24 hours a day every day so it's kind of a myth that you can make time we say it all the time trying to make some time you can't make time you just manage the time you've got it's the same so if you want to get technical about it you don't redeem time you make the best use of time the word time here there are two words for time in the uh, new testament the first is chronos from which we get our word chronological and it's the time of clocks and calendars and orbits around the sun and those kinds of things technical time. And then there's the word used here, kairos, which I have in brackets there by time, which is the opportune time, the appointed time. Uh, it's the word used in Luke chapter 4 verse 13 of Satan. After he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, it says that he left him until an opportune time. So he waited for another opportunity. So he's saying make the best use of the opportunities that you have. And then another really interesting phrase of Paul's because the days are evil. What do you think he means by that? The days are evil. Not morally evil, but the days are short. They're brief. Time gets away from you. Before you know it, the day's over and you didn't accomplish what you wanted. We all know that feeling. I've had a feeling for as many days as I've had this week. That's how many days this week I've had that feeling. I mean, it's just a very common idea but we don't think about it and say it out loud enough. The days are evil. The days are short. Before you know it, many years have gone by. And it's a hard thing to look back and see what you didn't accomplish. So we need to redeem and make the best use of time. Um, I want to go over some things that we can do with our time. Just some suggestions from the scriptures. And uh, we'll go through them one by one and make some points about them. Number one, 
We should value each moment. We've already talked about how valuable time is. It's your life you're talking about here. So yeah, obviously you should value your time. Uh, Psalm 118, 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Why do we always say that on Sundays? Um, every day applies there, doesn't it? Every day is the day the Lord has made. You should rejoice and be glad in it and not take it for granted. We could add to that. Life is short. Uh, Proverbs 27, 1 warns us, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And then James's question haunts a lot of us from James 4.14. What is your life? For it is a vapor or mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And that's, that's the truth. Um, I do elementary chapel at JCA on Wednesdays. And uh, last Wednesday, Kate Bender, who doesn't talk to me a whole lot, but... <laughs> You know, I think, I think she likes me, and I talked to her, tried to get her to talk to me, and I said, hey, Kate, what song do you want me to lead this morning? And she said, I'll fly away. And I didn't have any ideas for chapel, and so sometimes when I don't have an idea for chapel, I'll just roll off the song. So I sang the song, and I started saying, hey, do you guys know what I'll fly away means? And then I realized we're about to talk about death to a bunch of elementary school <laughs> kids. And on this particular day, their parents happened to be there for a field trip, and, uh, but I had already gotten into it, so we talked about Psalm 90, where I think that statement is made, verse 8, that our years are 70, or by reason of strength 80, and then we fly away. And uh, we talked about how the angels took Lazarus, Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, and uh, we did it. And I was saying things like, hey, you know, death is a part of life, right? And I kid you not, there was, I think he was a first grader, he started crying. And uh, I, sorry about this, Crystal, your kids were in there. Um, but uh, I said, at the end, I said, let's, uh, let's pick this up, you know, this is kind of heavy stuff, let's sing a song. And I said, somebody got a happy song for us, and a little girl raised her hand, and it, she wanted to sing Light the Fire, which has uplifting lyrics but the melody if you know it very well is kind of gloomy too so mm -hmm. after that was over I just went to the car before <laughs> the parents could pull me aside and have a talk with me but it is a fact of life and we do fly away and uh, life is brief and uncertain we need to value every moment we have it's very important so nine hours a day consuming media how much time compared to that do we spend in prayer and Bible study? 10 minutes? 20? How many hours a day do we do that? We compare. You know, your time on social media, two hours a day. Your time in God's Word. Do any of us spend two hours a day in God's Word? And it's a humbling question. What does it say about how we value our time when we spend so much of it in meaningless activity. We really need to think about that. So value your time. Value each moment. Number two, distinguish between the urgent and the important. There is a difference, right, between urgent and important. I heard a story about a man who had kept count of his time, what he did with every minute of every day, and on his 80th birthday, he got all his books out and calculated how he had spent his time and he spent five of his 80 years waiting on customers. He had a little shop. Five of his 80 years. Six months tying ties. Three months scolding children for running around his store. And eight days telling his dogs to lie down and be quiet. Now that little story leaves out how much time he spent recording all this stuff in the notebooks. Because that would take a whole lot of time. But what if you did that? And, you know, What if you really had the opportunity at the end of your life to know how much time you spent on each activity, how many of those things would be putting out fires, as we say? That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the urgent, the crises of the day. Now, that's not the same thing as spending your time on important things. Important things are things that give you results in the long term urgent things are things you just have to do 
or there's going to be a huge problem, a bigger problem in the short term. And we need to learn to distinguish just because you're doing something that is urgent doesn't mean that you're doing something that is important. Now, you may have to do it at that point. But if you did more, if you spent more time on the important things, you would have less urgent things to worry about in the long run. Uh, Stephen Covey, in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he elaborates on this a lot more than I just did. I'm just trying to get you to distinguish between urgent and important, but here's a chart from his book. And uh, he wants you to spend most of your time in quadrant two. You see there are four quadrants there. Quadrant two are the important but non-urgent things. Look at those, exercise, vocation, planning. We would say Bible study, <coughs> prayer, things that have big dividends in the long run. Um, parenting, conversations with your children, conversations with your spouse or loved ones, um, service for others. Um, urgent matters, a crying baby. You gotta take care of that, right? Kitchen fire, some calls are urgent. Those are urgent and important at the same time. There are a lot of things down here in quadrant three that are urgent, but that are not important. This is where Drew spends a lot of his time. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. Now it's urgent. This is an urgent, <laughs> this is a great example of an urgent problem. I've got an exclamation point here. Failed to connect. Putting out fires here. Okay. Oh boy. Wasting my time going back over our slides. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. All right, let's get back to our chart. So quadrant three, non-important urgent items, interruptions, distractions, other calls. Um, quadrant four, trivia, busy work, time wasters. Those are not urgent, not important. So you're going to spend time every day on all four of those, but the people, the theory is anyway, the people who spend the most time in quadrant two, who can stay in that spot the longest, are the most successful people. I don't know what you think about that. I, it makes sense to me. The urgent, I mean the important, but non-urgent items. How many of you have always just think if it's urgent, it's important? Not necessarily true. If it's important, it's urgent. Not necessarily. And how many of you feel like you're just under somebody else's control all day long? If you feel like your days are controlled by other people, you spend all your time over here on the left side of that chart in the urgent matters. You're just running around taking care of whatever people think you ought to be taking care of. And we talked a little bit last week about how to get over on the right side especially quadrant two, the Lord had to do that by force sometimes. He dismissed the crowds, told the disciples, I want you to get in a boat. I don't want you to just go away. I want you to get in a boat and go to the other side of the sea. I mean, that, that had to have been hard for him to do. And if you're a people pleaser, this is really hard. Because you don't want to upset anybody. You don't want to make anybody mad. But if you don't do it, you're going to get to the end of your life and you're going to say, I spent all my days doing things that other people wanted me to do, which is dangerous. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, number three, what should I do? Every day, uh, okay, I thought that blinked out on me again. Look for opportunities. Look for opportunities. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. So there's a priority there. First, the household faith, that's your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then if you have opportunity with non-Christians, those who are in your community or in, at your school or people that you don't go to church with but you have some kind of influence with or you see an opportunity, help them as well. Any opportunity you have, seize that opportunity. Uh, James says something similar in that same paragraph that we talked about a moment ago from James 4, 14, where he said your life is a vapor or a mist that appears for a little time and it vanishes. In James 4, 17, he says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. We take that out of context all the time because it's a nice little passage to hang over people's head. I'm 
maybe just talking about preachers here, but you know, you know it's right to um, you know, have a Bible study. So if you're not having a Bible study, you've sinned. Or you know it's right to fill in the blank. And if you're not doing that, that's sinful. But, I mean, there are some applications that should be made there. But in context, James is talking about the opportunities. Go back to the meaning of time, uh, kairos, and the brevity of life. And your life is a mist that appears for a little time and vanishes away. He says, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll go and do such and such. Your boasting is evil. All such boasting is evil. And then he gets down to verse 17. So, so, therefore, whoever knows the right thing to do now, that's what he's saying, whoever knows the opportunity and fails to seize that opportunity in the time he's been given, for him it is sin. It's sinful to waste opportunities. The problem is, a lot of times we have our nose in a device, and we don't see the opportunities around us. We're not alert enough. Somebody compared compassion and I thought this was great. They said compassion is awareness. Because you may feel goodwill in general, but you may not realize the needs around you. And so you're not showing compassion. Compassion is being aware of a need that, that's around you. And if you're constantly being distracted, then you're not going to be able to have that kind of awareness and alert alertness. So think about it. How many relationships failed because instead of having a conversation with somebody, somebody was distracted by social media? How many opportunities to serve were lost because of just wanting to be distracted, not being aware? So many opportunities go by. And this is something that Satan is very happy about. How many of you have heard of the book Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis? really interesting book. You can get copies of it pretty cheap. Um, I recommend it. It's totally a work of fiction. It's uh, imagining correspondence between two demons, um, like a chief demon named Screwtape, which is a great, great name for a demon, not for a job. Uh, Screwtape. And then uh, his apprentice demon is Wormwood. So he's writing to Wormwood, and he's telling him how basically to condemn people. And one of the strategies that Screwtape introduces to Wormwood is called the nothing strategy. And he says, you should try this nothing strategy so that people get to the end of their lives and say, I now see that I spent most of my life in doing neither what I ought nor what I liked. Now, maybe it's hard for you to imagine saying that, but replace the word like with the word day. And have you ever had a day like that? I see that I spent most of my day doing neither what I ought or what I liked. All of us have had days like that. And all it takes to exchange day for life is just to stack the days up like that and then get to the end of your life. And you're saying that kind of thing. And nobody wants that, right? And social media is a part of this. It's not the only thing. There are a lot of other things that you've probably been mulling over as we've been going through this. Another excerpt from this book. This is not the whole thing. I'll read a longer excerpt, but Screwtape explains the nothing strategy. He says, the nothing strategy is very strong, strong enough to steal away a man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in a dreary flickering of the mind over it knows not what and knows not why, in the gratification of curiosity so feeble that the man is only half aware of them in drumming of fingers and kicking of heels, in whistling tunes that he does not like, or in the long, dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition to give them a relish, but, whence, but which, once chance association has started them, the creature is too weak and fuddled to shake off. It's scary because it's something you can see happening. Spending your life not tempted by lusts or the things that are obviously sin, but just doing good things instead of the best things, being Martha instead of Mary. You know, social media in and of itself is not bad, and I know it may sound like I'm saying that in this class. I'm not teaching this class to tell you to abstain from social media. 
that would only take one week, but I'm taking 12 weeks so that we can learn to use it responsibly. And so it's not, you know, the bad things are obvious. Those are the things that are really in a lot of ways easier to avoid. It's the good things that we choose over the best things that really steal away our time and make us have the biggest regrets near the end of our life. And so I'm not trying to say that you need to become a productivity wizard or anything like that. Um, you know, I'm not telling you to get a planner and start, like, planning out every hour of your day. I think the best way that all of us can put this into practice, these practical points that we've been making, and make the best use of our opportunities or our time, is simply just start by carving out a little time for God every day. And then maybe paying attention. You know, just paying attention to how much time you spend on social media. Do you hit that two-hour mark that our kids are hitting? Are you letting your kids hit that two-hour mark? Shoot to cut that back a little. Just like if you're trying to get off of coffee or sweets or something, just cut it back a little every day. And use that time. You say, well, I don't have any time to study the Bible. Well, if you have that app on your phone, see how much time you spend on your phone. And if it's like four hours or six hours, take 30 minutes of that as a starter and spend it reading your Bible or praying or doing both. And then make it more and more where you're spending more time with God than you do on your phone. Any comments or anything you want to say in wrapping this up, Jason? I think it's interesting, Chad, that you're inviting them to do it. It's obviously well before social media. Yeah. That phrase and that quote flickering their minds over they know not what and their lives. And yes. that's just going through Twitter and scrolling. You're going through yeah. Facebook and scrolling. You don't, you don't know why you're doing it. You know, don't know half these people. And it's flickering. And yet you're yeah. flickering it by your face. scary how he could see that coming. But it just shows that distractions like that predate, I mean, of course we know this, but predate social media. Right. It's just this, this vision of, of what it was. The way you described it, it just points so much to that, that concept of scrolling through social media. Yeah. You know, just mindless scrolling. Yeah, it's amazing. Any other comments? All right, that's it for tonight. Appreciate everybody's attention this evening.